Welcome to the Atheists of Florida YouTube channel. We are pleased to offer some of the most significant speakers and the profound issues of our times. If you like today's video, please hit the like button. If you have already subscribed, thank you. If not, you know what to do. So the screen is yours. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And I'm going to uh, shamelessly promote actually my latest book as well. Oh. I've had two books published this uh, this year. The first is Sodom Reverence that uh, Judy kindly mentioned. And uh, the second one just came out about, uh, about a month ago, actually. It's called <clears throat> Bad Faith race and the rise of the religious right it's a short book it's about 121 pages about the uh, the origins of the religious right I, I mentioned that because it's it's timely i think uh, given the texas uh, legislation and the supreme court's uh, refusal to put a stay on that legislation and uh, what i demonstrate in this book and i think beyond dispute is that despite the religious rights uh, persistence attempt persistent attempts to insist that opposition to abortion is what mobilized them politically in the 1970s. It was in fact the defense of racial segregation in evangelical institutions, including Bob Jones University, as well as segregation academies. And so this, um, this uh, little book tries to put the record straight. And so I, um, I apologize for self-promotion there, but uh, it's 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 relevant certainly to what's going on in the world today, as is I think uh, solemn reverence, uh, separation of church and state in American life. Uh, this is an issue that has interested me for a long time, um, especially with the rise of the religious right. Although um, that was not the immediate catalyst for the book. Uh, Coincident with the emergence of the religious right, you had all of these narratives about America being a Christian nation. America is and always has been a Christian nation, according to many of these um, uh, people associated with the religious right. And in fact, there's a whole sort of uh, industry within evangelicalism that tries to promote this notion that America is a, a Christian nation. Uh, you've probably heard of the name David Barton. Uh, David Barton uh, peddles himself as a historian, even though um, he's not credentialed as a historian in any way, he doesn't have uh, advanced degrees uh, in the field. And he has written all sorts of books um, insisting that America is and always has been a Christian nation, that the founders were all Christian and so forth. And I, I, I try to put that to rest <laughs> in, this, in this book. Uh, which unfortunately I'm sure will not sell as many books as David Barton's books uh, sell, but uh, that's the nature of the beast these days. So in this book, I, I look at uh, the origins of this notion of the, the separation of church and state, and probably the, uh, the best known progenitor of this notion or this metaphor about the separation of church and state is Roger Williams, who's the founder of the Baptist tradition in America. And historically, Baptists have been the watchmen on the walls, watch women on the walls as well, uh, of this line of separation between church and state. And I think what, one of the things that people miss about Roger Williams uh, is his background and his use of this metaphor. That is to say, Roger Williams was initially a Puritan minister in Massachusetts. He was expelled from Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, because of his uh, so-called dangerous and diverse new opinions. And he uh, sought shelter in Rhode Island and sought to provide there a haven for religious toleration and religious diversity. And he is the founder in 1631 of the Baptist tradition in America. So this notion of the separation of church and state and uh, its connection with the Baptist tradition is very strong and historical, even though since 1979, the Southern Baptist Convention really is largely um, defaulted on that 
a responsibility in, in American society. But if you look at the metaphor itself coming from uh, Roger Williams, what strikes me is that he wanted to separate the garden of the church from the wilderness of the world by means of a wall of separation. And when most people refer to that, they just kind of say, well, yeah, garden, church, uh, wilderness of the world, um, uh, wall of separation, and, and not really look into those metaphors. But I think it's important to remember, and this is probably one of the theses of the book, uh, if not the thesis of the book, it's important to remember that the people in the 17th century did not share our romantic understanding of wilderness. They were not members of the Sierra Club, for example. Uh, they did not uh, share our post Thoreauian or Thoreauian ideas about wilderness. And so when Roger Williams wanted to separate the garden of the church from the wilderness of the world, I think what people miss is that he was trying to shield the integrity of the faith from too close an association with the state. And so he thought that if the state were too closely tied with religion, that religion, the faith would become trivialized and fetishized if he did that. And I'm gonna fast forward a couple of centuries to give you an example of this. As uh, Judy was kind to mention, I was one of the expert witnesses in, in the Alabama 10 Commandments case when uh, Judge uh, Roy Moore, uh, who claims to be a Baptist, by the way, but he's not a Baptist by any uh, real uh, um, application of that uh, definition of that term. Roy Moore uh, plopped this two and a half ton granite monument in the lobby of the judicial building in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, emblazoned with the Ten Commandments. And uh, what, what made that action particularly unconstitutional is that he steadfastly refused any other religious representations in that space including, by the way, a petition from the Alabama Atheist Association, both members, no doubt, who wanted to put their sentiments in that space, and he said no. So that's, of course, what made it uh, a violation of the First Amendment and, and uh, the separation of church and state. What I found especially, um, I guess, amusing about this is that after Judge Myron Thompson ruled correctly that that represented a an abrogation of the First Amendment, particularly the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, and ordered the monument removed, one of the religious right protesters screamed, get your hands off my God. Now, if I'm not mistaken, one of those commandments etched on the side of the monument said something about graven images. And that was precisely Roger Williams' point a too close an association between the faith and the state would ine inevitably result in a diminution of the faith. And that's my overall thesis, I think, in this book. I write from, as, a, uh, as a person of faith. I'm an Episcopal priest. Uh, I grew up as an evangelical. We can talk about that later if you want to talk about uh, the nuances of that. Uh, but I believe that religion, along with the ability not to believe or subscribe to any religion, that those sentiments have flourished in American life precisely because of the separation of church and state. So when I see the Southern Baptist Convention in 1979 take a radical right turn and effectively give up on their historical role in uh, policing this line of separation of church and state, uh, I think it's bad for the country for all sorts of reasons, but it's also bad for the integrity of the faith. Uh, religion has flourished in America as nowhere else, I believe, precisely because the First Amendment set up a kind of free marketplace for religion and where you have all these competitors in this marketplace of ideas for uh, the, uh, the uh, allegiance of individual Americans. And so uh, that is uh, probably the overall theme uh, of this uh, little book, again, a very slim volume.
on the issue of uh, separation of church and state. So I talk about Roger Williams. I talk also about William Penn and his uh, holy experiment in Pennsylvania, where he uh, made a, a place that would be religiously diverse and multicultural uh, quite intentionally because he is a Quaker, of course, had been uh, persecuted back in, uh, in, 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 in England, and he wanted to avoid that. And then I look at uh, the religions of the founders, and again, um, with probably the exception, maybe the sole exception of John Witherspoon, who of course was a Presbyterian minister, uh, the founders uh, you know, would, would be denied membership in any evangelical church that I, <laughs> that I know of today uh, because of their, their uh, beliefs. Uh, they couldn't subscribe to the theology or the uh, statements of faith in these uh, evangelical congregations. And then the Treaty of Tripoli, I think, is uh, probably the most damning uh, evidence against people like David Barton, who claim that America is and always has been a Christian nation. The Treaty of Tripoli uh, um, includes uh, the passage, I'll try to find it very quickly here as I talk, um, about America is not, it's part of the treaty, uh, it is a not a Christian nation. It says, uh, uh, the, uh, the treaty itself, says, as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. I mean, it's pretty clear uh, that uh, that was the understanding. John Adams sent the Treaty of Tripoli to the U.S. Senate uh, with a note of, uh, of uh, uh, support uh, saying, you know, the Senate needs to uh, ratify this treaty. It was read aloud before the United States Senate, and it was uh, ratified unanimously by the United States Senate. And this is, uh, th these are people who ostensibly, according to these Christian nationalists, uh, ostensibly uh, believe that America was uh, founded as a Christian nation. It's, it's, it's simply not the case. Uh, I'm skipping here uh, rather uh, broadly and, and, and uh, uh, generously. Uh, so we can go back and revisit any of these topics, certainly in, in our discussion. But there have been various attempts throughout American history to designate the United States as a Christian nation. For example, during the Civil War, many people on the Union side in the North, of course, were uh, embarrassed by the fact that the U.S. Constitution did not mention God, did not uh, 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 explicitly say that America was a Christian nation, whereas the Confederate Constitution went uh, to great pains to write God into that Constitution. Well, that was a source of embarrassment for some people in the North. And there was a, an organization that was uh, set up called the, I uh, was one of this, um, I always forget the name. It's uh, actually the, the letters are NRA, as in National Rifle Association, but it's the National uh something amendment i think national religious amendment i guess association of something of that sort I, i'm sorry it's slipping my mind at the moment and they uh, 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 sent a delegation to abraham lincoln and said uh, we think that the constitution should be amended to acknowledge god and to mention and and to argue that the united states is a christian nation and lincoln you know very wisely i think temporized <laughs> before these uh uh, before this delegation, he said, well, let's remember that uh, amending the Constitution is something that should not be taken lightly. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> There's no evidence, of course, that he ever did, uh, that he was able to put them off. But there have been various attempts throughout American history to amend the Constitution in order to uh, state that uh, the United States is a Christian nation. Most recently, of course, maybe not most recently, but certainly in the recent past, in the wake of the school prayer decisions in the early 1960s, there was an attempt that was actually supported by people like Everett Dirksen in the U.S. Senate to amend the Constitution and write God into the Constitution. Uh, fortunately, of course, that failed as, uh, as it should have. So uh, again, uh, American history, I think, is littered with attempts to rewrite history, rewrite uh, the U.S. Constitution, in order to insist that America is and always has been a, a Christian nation. It's simply not the case. It's historically not the case. And uh, my argument, of course, is that uh, we are better off uh, the, for the fact that those efforts have uh, failed and have failed uh, rather consistently throughout American history. Where we stand now, um, uh, who knows? I mean, we live in uh, chaotic times. Uh, 
and uh, the Supreme Court, I think, can no longer be counted on uh, to enforce that wall of separation between church and state. Uh, the, the Montana decision, I think, is deeply distressing, certainly is to me, uh, on all sorts of grounds, but uh, certainly because it uh, threatens to um, erase that line of separation between church and state, which is uh, so important in American life. I think I'll, st I'll stop my remarks here and then uh, I, mean, I could go on if you want me to go on, but uh, I, I'm certainly willing to entertain uh, your thoughts and, and your questions and your observations. Well, anybody have questions, please raise your hand using the, uh, in the reactions tab on your bottom of your screen. I think most of you know how to do that. I can't believe nobody has raised their hand yet. So, <laughs> um, I will ask you. Um, oh, somebody's asking about the Montana decision. What's happening in the comments? Yeah, mostly criticism of religion, which is not exactly what we're here to discuss. But um, oh, I see. We okay. the the part that scares me right now is like you said the supreme court and what what uh, we don't have any resolution if they if they uphold uh, religion uh, being the, the country being declared a christian nation yeah. how likely are you and do you think that is to happen well i'm not sure how, how they would do that i mean that would uh, that would really necessitate a constitutional amendment i should think but I don't think there's any question either that they're slowly whittling away at that uh, that line of separation. Um, I, I, somebody asked about the Montana decision. Uh, it was it's um, uh, Espinosa v. Montana it was decided just to cut, well, uh, actually got it into the book. So it was it was not that long ago, uh, and this allowed the yes Espinosa uh, v. Montana Department of Revenue, and it was decided 2020, I think. I, I don't quote me on that, but it allowed it. It mandated that because the the state of Montana had uh, scholarship funds available for. Um, private education that they they could not exclude religious education from from that um, construct and uh, you know again that's uh, to me that's a that's a very very important uh, uh, line that the su supreme court crossed and and uh, i also talk in the book about the blaine amendments uh, that came up in the 19th century that uh, essentially barred public support or taxpayer support for parochial schools. Now, uh, there's no question that the Blaine Amendments were directed against Catholics. It was an anti-Catholic uh, movement in, in many respects. Nevertheless, I think the, uh, despite the fact that it's tinged with, uh, with um, um, racism of, 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 of a sort, uh, it was the right decision to maintain that separation between public funding and religious or parochial schools. Uh, the Blaine Amendment uh, failed in the US Constitution, but many of the states in the 19th century adopted Blaine Amendments to prohibit the forming or the funding of uh, parochial schools by uh, taxpayer funding funding. So for me, the, the, the Montana Espinosa decision is, um, uh, is frightening because I think it does open the doors for the taxpayer support of, of religion, in this case, religious schools. Yeah, it seems like they're finding all kinds of loopholes and ways around the Constitution and, to impose so. religious views. No, on I, yeah, I, I think the Supreme Court should worry us. I really do, because um, uh, as my friend Frank Schaefer said uh, the other day, uh, the uh, the the right, the religious right, uh, has been playing the long game in terms of the judiciary uh, ever since the late 1970s when the movement got started uh, with the Federalist Society and all this, uh, all these other organizations. And now they have, um, as I understand, that Amy Coney Barrett is a product of the Federalist Society. I think uh, Brett Kavanaugh is away is as well. I think all and, the new ones uh, are. 
all the new ones, yeah, all the Trump uh, appointees are are Federalist people, and uh, that's and that should be a warning sign, I think. And what we can do about it, I think, is another matter. But uh, I think we need to be wary and watchful about that. Um, Mr. Peterson, you have a question. Sorry. Okay, if you can hear me now. Um, yes. Yes, I, 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 I thought you, had, you gave a great uh, talk with lots to think about within it. And uh, one, one observation that I think is common is that America is, uh, it could be compared with a wild river, tumultuous river, without, with very many uh, highly divergent currents within it. And, uh, of course, religion being split up as it is with uh, multiple different uh, churches and denominations, uh, many of which are um, in um, are in conflict with each other in, in terms of trying to gain members and so forth. And of course, we atheists are a very minor tributary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, I think a vital one. And uh, I think we all recognize uh, the importance of promoting freedom of thought and so forth, as you yourself have done. Um, yet, I, I can't help but to think that we also have a a, a problem in that we are uh, promoting the freedom of religion as we must, freedom of thought. That's what we're ostensibly about. And at the same time, other people supposedly promoting the freedom of their own religion yes, sure. are, <laughs> are creating yep. uh, tendencies toward a very uh, monocultural uh, um, uh, situation. Uh, and, and of course, this is the fundamental uh, uh, problem that, 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 that we have. How do you see this ever being overcome? <laughs> well, I think I'm just to, to, to uh, uh, second what you say. Uh, I, I think a kind of short reading of the religious right itself is that the religious right uh, uh, was responding to their loss of hegemony in American society. And so, you know, they they sought to and still seek, of course, to to legislate their values onto all of uh, uh, Americans, because they had lost um, their their hold uh, on American society. Um, you know, if, you know, to try to answer your question, I, first of all, I usually plead that I'm a historian, not a prognosticator, but I'll give it a shot. Nevertheless, nevertheless, um, I. I I guess I'm saying this without a whole lot of evidence that this is going to happen. But nevertheless, I say this, hopefully, that Americans in the past have very often risen to their better selves. Now, not as quickly as we should, <laughs> uh, not as uh, enthusiastically as we might have, but Americans really do, I think, or at least have, and maybe until recently, and I need to probably add that caveat, uh, come, to, come around to a sense that we need to affirm the principles in our charter documents. Now, much, much, much too belatedly, in issues of race or even of gender in terms of equality and so forth. And I, I don't think there's any question that we've had a setback over the last at least five years, but probably even a little bit more than that uh, in that respect. But my hope rests in the historical observation that we do eventually come around to our better selves and embrace the principles that are encoded into our, our charter documents. And of course, the, 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 in many ways, the foundational principle is respect for the rights of minorities uh, and allowing them to flourish as well with the same rights that everyone else uh, enjoys, that the majority enjoys. And uh, I, I hope that's where we'll come. I, I hope. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Jim, did yeah. that answer your question? <clears throat> okay. Um, I, I did read just recently um, 
that it only takes 25% of the population to turn the, the, the whole group, the whole organization, the government towards yeah. a path. And it yeah. scares me that right now the, the uh, Christian nationalists make up about 24% of the population. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, no. I, there, there's there's every reason to be frightened of the, yeah. about this. It's it's um, not a not a happy situation. Yeah, uh, Joe, I'm going to get to you in a minute. But Jim Young is having computer problems, and he put a question in the um, uh, chat that he wants asked that got in before you raised your hand. In light of the current state of affairs, we observe that much of the wall of separation has already been destroyed. In fact, it was never fully erect. What chance do we have to strengthen it with a SCOTUS pack with right-wing religious nuts? How to proceed? Um, and he's, he modified that to say, um, how do we, uh, I'm not sure because if there is no path to reinstate the wall, what is the path to get it done? <laughs> well, that's not a loaded question, is it? <laughs> um, uh, well, and, and I, 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 I'm sorry. He also asked, "What hope is there to get it done?" He yeah. Says he should well, have. What hope is there to get it done? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I think you know. Perhaps there's less hope than than, than there should be. That's for sure. Uh, you know, I, I guess what I've what I've tried to do in, in my own work and writings, uh, you know, this book, but also, uh, you know, I do op-eds for newspapers and so forth. Uh, what I have tried to do is appeal to religious people uh, in their own self-interest, right? Really, as I said, religion has flourished here as nowhere else precisely because of the First Amendment, because of this competitive, competitive marketplace we have for ideas and religious ideas. And I, you know, I, I expect, you know, a lot, not everybody in on this uh, conversation is, is, would be all that enthusiastic about that. But, you know, for their own self-interest, look at the history and look at what has been possible for religious groups in America. I mean, this is my field, this is what I study. I mean, they're just, there's massive, uh, you know, last time I checked in my, in my directory, there were 53 denominations of Baptists in America, not churches, denominations. I mean, that's far too many Baptists by, any, by anyone's calculations, it's far too many. But it's, it's, it's testament, uh, testimony to the fact that religion flourishes when it is not encumbered by the state and doesn't have the favor of the state. And by the way, uh, the, um, 19, uh, 1776, uh, you know, we Americans remember it for the, uh, the Declaration of Independence. But arguably, the most important thing that happened in 1976 was the publication of The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, his, uh, his brief for free market capitalism. And one of the examples he uses about how the marketplace works is religion. He says, if there's no state church, if there's no uh, uh, favoritism, religion is going to flourish. And I think America has has uh, uh, vindicated his point, uh, his, his argument. So uh, that's been one of the things I've tried to do over the last few years. You can see how successful I've been in my my argumentation, of course, but I try to appeal to, to religious folks on their own terms and in their own self-interest. Don't try to level this wall of separation between between church and state. Uh, it's not in your interest to do that. And uh, I, I think it's not in anybody's interest to do that. And, and that's that's what I'm, I'm trying to uh, to argue. Now, um, you know, what hope do I have that that message will final, finally sink in? I, you know, the problem is I don't have my own media empire <laughs> the way uh, these people do. And uh, in, in, until there's some sort of, uh, um, you know, at least parity on the media landscape between, you know, the, the, the left with which I de identify uh, um, without question and, and uh, the right, uh, I think there's not a lot of hope of that message getting through. Now, maybe the new media, and I'm too old to really understand it, but the new media, so-called new media, social media and so forth is the way to, uh, to, to finally make that case and, and to, um, and, 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 and to get the message out, but uh, you know, I'm not savvy enough to, to do that. 
I, I think if I remember correctly, the um, one of the reasons that Jefferson became an, such a supporter of state church separation was because of what he saw being done to Baptist ministers. Yes, that's and that's right. It's, cer just, it's certainly the case with Madison. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, Joe, you can unmute yourself and ask your question or comment. Uh, yes, um, I just um, I think there's a question in here somewhere, but it seems to me that self-interest, the idea that having lots of other religions um, because we don't have a state religion is an abstraction. But tens of millions of tax free dollars a year is a reality. Absolutely. And frankly, if I were a religious person, I wouldn't give a damn if there were any diversity at all. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as I uh, was able to belly right up to the trough. Yeah. And so the question is, because it seems to me that religions are good at two things. Um, spreading the word. I mean, they're in all the media, the Internet, the schools, oh, yeah. the, mm -hmm. you name it, on every street corner. And the other thing that they're even better at, and that is raising money. Um, yep. Which do you think is uh, they're better at? <laughs> well, I think so, I think the two are intertwined. <laughs> uh, you know, the ability to, yeah, right. but, but yeah. I'm just saying that the, the hell with that. You know, uh, um, I don't give a damn about diversity. Just send me those tax free dollars. That's all I care about. Yeah. Well, it's um, yeah, and that that issue actually you know, circles back to the. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, that that issue actually circles back to the religious right. What happened in the in the 1970s? Again, it had nothing to do with abortion, and you know I'm happy to talk about that if you want to uh, <laughs> head down that uh, uh, that path into the raspberry bushes. But uh, it was uh, what got them going. What got Fall, Jerry Fall and others going was a defense of their tax exempt exemption for their racially segregated institutions, and. Um, uh, and what I find fascinating is the way they they um, they did a sleight of hand, so that as they are presenting their activism, they are careful not to say we're defending racism, we're defending racist, racial segregation, we are defending freedom of religion, we are defending ourselves from government interference in our our institutions failing to acknowledge something you all know that tax exemption is a form of public subsidy right every church that i know of is tax exempt that means all the other citizens in the neighborhood have to pay up a little bit more for fire protection, police protection, parks, public services. Tax exemption is a form of public subsidy. So the federal government has every right in the world to come in and say, on the basis of the Brown decision in 1954 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that these public institutions cannot legally segregate on the basis of race uh, and and but they were very very crafty in how they they shifted that argument away from a defense of racial segregation to a defense of so-called religious freedom uh, it's it, it's uh, i I'm, I'm sometimes when i think about this and i write about this i'm just uh, it, it 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 leaves me breathless. You know the 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 both the audacity and the mendacity of what they did in in terms of framing the uh, their movement in the nineteen seventies. Thank you, um, Bill. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, um, there are several points that come to my mind, and I'm very eager to hear your your thoughts about it. Number one, which you just identified, is the use of racism in the game. Yeah. I mean, the political power structure has shifted so dramatically over the last 50 years. Uh, and I would really love to know how you see 
the the effort on the part of the people on the right who have used racism and religion to yeah. get a almost a monopoly position, which is not unlike what they had in the South before yeah. the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so here we are. And what's your take on that? No, you're you're absolutely right, and I think, um, and again, this is one of the things I, I addressed in the in the newest book. Um, I, I, I you know I like you folks. I um, if I can presume to say so, uh, I, I lived through the 1970s, and uh, I I was and I was very much in, embedded in the evangelical world at that time. What I call the evangelical subculture, and at the time, I was just utterly confused about why evangelicals would abandon Jimmy Carter in 1976 for Ronald Reagan. And as I was writing the book, I did a little bit more research uh, on Reagan and uh, I come, I've come to see him as the missing link in terms of race. Uh, so again, the religious right, I'll say it again um, at the, the risk of, of exhaustion, I, I apologize for doing this, uh, the religious right galvanized as a political movement in the 1970s to defend racial segregation. And when I began to look more closely into Reagan, uh, it make, began to make sense. Uh, Reagan had a start in politics defending, I'm sorry, um, trying to overturn the Rumford Fair Housing Act in California in 1964 that sought to provide or guarantee um, equal access to housing, uh, both in rental market as well as in, in uh, real estate and sales. He was an outspoken opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Throughout his campaigns, he repeatedly invoked the racially charged slogan, law and order. And who can forget his vile caricature of these mythical welfare queens, mm -hmm. women of color living off the public dole. Uh, all of that, but then for me, the clincher and the, the issue that um, is, uh, magnifies uh, Reagan's character is that on August 3rd, 1980, he opened his general election campaign for the presidency his first campaign appearance after winning the nomination in Detroit. And I can see you know that know what I'm talking about. In of all places, Philadelphia, Mississippi, at the Neshoba County Fair, the place where 16 summers earlier, members of the Ku Klux Klan in collusion with the Sheriff's Department, abducted, tortured, and murdered three civil rights workers during Freedom Summer. And uh, Reagan, of course, was the master of symbolism. And lest anybody mistake his meaning in his speech at the Neshoba County Fair on August 3rd, 1980, he invoked the age old segregationist battle cry, states rights. And when I was able to put that together with the origins of the religious right, then Donald Trump may, began to make a whole lot more sense to me and why it is that 81% of white evangelicals supported Donald Trump in 2016. And to me, there's just an un unbroken line uh, between those two, two events. So yes, you're absolutely right. Race, sadly, you know, America's really original sin <laughs> uh, crops up once again, and it's very, very much part of that narrative. Absolutely. Bill, did that answer your question? Uh, very well. He, he confirmed exactly what my thinking is. <laughs> it's always nice to have that happen. Isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Actually, uh, I think it would uh, be important to understand the relationship between this political power and the religious power and the way especially the people on the right, who are essentially the American Taliban. I yeah. mean, they want to force their religious ideas on everybody. 
Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and again, it's you know that's I I think that's you know if you look at the larger perspective, I think that's that's the shorthand uh, description for the religious right is is uh, we no longer have the hegemony that we have in America we once had in American society or thought we had, uh, and uh, you know, damn it, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna impose it on everybody else. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yes. Pretty scary. Um, Michael, you had your hand up and then put it down. Did you have something you wanted to say or ask? Um, I guess sort of both. <laughs> um, I like that you're talking about, you know, narrative. I think a lot of this is really about who's controlling the narrative and often the religious right falls back on these notions of uh, quote unquote how America has this unique tradition of having religion and that makes it right that we have religion and state and in fact even there was that uh, I think it was I've been trying to look this up Marsh, Marsh versus Chambers I think was the one where they said that basically it was okay for Congress to have invocations of a religious nature beforehand because America has a tradition of doing so that you know goes back to the founding of the country and so forth so i mean basically i'm just kind of wondering because i mean what we are facing and what i we i mean atheists and those that don't have religious beliefs is we don't have that long tradition of stuff <laughs> happening like we can't point back saying we have a long tradition of atheism in government because we don't so i mean i'm just wondering how how do we control or kind of steer the narrative to where we're showing that uh, there is, you know, basically, how do we control this narrative? What can we say to that traditional argument? Yeah, well, I mean, you can, you can invoke Thomas Paine, I suppose, or even Thomas Jefferson, sure. if you wanted, you wanted to do that. But, and, and the issue of the chaplaincy, I, I think is, is really interesting. I, I, I touch it on that in the book. Uh, what had happened is that um, under Washington and Adams, particularly Adams, there was the um, there was the the the, pr the practice begun of uh, opening congressional se sessions with prayer and, and so forth, and um, also Adams uh, declaring uh, national um, uh, fast days and, and so forth, and uh, Jefferson, who after all had won the presidency in the 19 in the 1800 presidential election which was arguably the the nastiest uh, presidential campaign in american history believe it or not it was really quite uh intense and over the issue of religion because uh, jefferson was cast as this uh, enemy of religion of course um, and to some degree he was but what what it, when jefferson uh became president uh I think he decided he 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 refused to to name any more fast days, but he allowed the uh, tradition of opening con Congress with prayer to go unchallenged or the congressional chaplain. And I think, as nearly as I can tell, it's just a matter of of Jefferson saying, you know, wait a minute, I'm I'm just not going to die in this mountain. Uh, the the president has been uh, established, and uh, I, you know, this is a fight I just don't want to. Uh, don't want to make. And so that's how we have that tradition that's been handed down uh, into the present. Now, I'm curious, maybe perhaps uh, some of you folks know, has there ever been uh, an atheist um, um, invocation before uh, a session of Congress to this point? I mean, I, don't, I know there's been uh, Hindu and Islamic and so forth, uh, or Muslim, but uh, has there ever been, uh, or, or even a humanistic um, prayer, or no, it's not, wouldn't be a prayer, <laughs> uh, a humanistic <laughs> a statement. <laughs> One of the things that I have to say that I find so interesting about the Ethical Culture Society and their, their meetings, and I've, they've asked me to come lecture many times, uh, is that uh, the, structure, the structure is very much like a church service, <laughs> even though there's no invocation of Jesus or, or God or a deity. Um, all right. Is anybody aware of this? Has, has this happened? I, I, I honestly don't know. Jim Peterson, do you know? Uh, well, yes, now that you ask. Uh, there, uh, there has been uh, numerous um, 
humanist manifestos. There have been four of them, in fact. Yeah, since yeah. yeah but has there ever been a, a person who so. talked to the Congress as an invocation? Well, okay. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, humanists are very much concerned about um, uh, the problems of um, ethical living, and it is frequently discussed. Well, obviously, as you pointed out, there's no prayer because most of us do not uh, hold with the existing right. deity. So there won't be any point in trying to, to supplicate such an individual. Nevertheless, uh, we do have the problem of living with ourselves, and uh, which is plenty enough for most people. Um, yeah. In terms of a reference to anything like a prayer, I'm afraid I, I, I can't think of anything at the, at the moment. Although uh, humanists do frequently participate, as do atheists, in the um, invocations uh, here, especially uh, many of us have given invocations before city and county commissions and school boards, etc. So yeah. um, okay, we still want to participate, but obviously on our own terms. Yeah, yeah but I, but, I but, can't but, think of any that's ever been done before the U.S. Congress. In fact, we we hardly ever have anybody who's openly not uh, a non-believer, not even saying they're atheists, but just right. a, a non-believer. Well, actually, well, we do have the well, Sacred Caucus now. Uh, yeah, Judy, if I may, the, yeah, there is a, a humanist caucus, and it, it actually attracts about um, yeah. there's about a, about 100 members who participate, at least two of whom are openly members of the American Humanist Association. So this is a trend over the last few years that I mm -hmm. am much heartened by, and I think right. uh, yeah. I hope it presages another change. Yeah. Eileen, did you want to say something, even though you didn't put your hand? Well, up? I was I was watching uh, Dan Barker, one of the older um, programs recently, and I think he was they were suing to try to get in front of Congress uh, with the invocation, but I think it was already, I think they kept turning them down, and also the National Day of Prayer. They wanted to do a moment of silence. Uh, anyway, I think so far we've never been able to get an atheist to, to do an invocation in Congress that I think of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, they keep trying. It's unfortunate, but I guess I'm surprised. Yeah. 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 yeah, a moment of silence is good enough. Hey, you know, uh, co Congress is not exactly a, a place known for uh, political bravery, I think, yeah. especially these yeah. days. <laughs> I'm curious on your take really? on things like the Bladenberg. Bladen Ladensburg cross, which is now considered not a religious symbol. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a cross well, I mean, hey, hey, you know, uh, that brings me back to Roger Williams, right? <laughs> Roger Williams, uh, you, you know, the 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 diminution of the faith when you try to to to, uh, to get the state involved in it. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, that's a, that's a fascinating example, I think. Yeah. Mr. Peterson, you have another question or comment? Yes, uh, referring to your comments earlier, uh, giving the, um, the fact that uh, the evangelical movement has long attracted uh, and, and has developed a racist core to it, which became evident in the 70s and 80s with, as you pointed out, the election of Ronald Reagan. Why are there black evangelicals? Yeah, well, it's, I, I think it's historic. I mean, the, that's and sometimes the way I describe it is that these are these are movements that 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 uh, developed along parallel rather than intersecting tracks. And so, uh, because of the long, sorry history of, of segregation in American life, no, slave religion goes all the way back, of course, to the antebellum period and even before that. And uh, it was uh, evangelicalism, particularly in the South, that uh, that was the the form of Christianity to which the slaves converted, um, you know, some more willingly than others, of course. And so that has, you know, that that began a whole uh, a tradition of the slave preacher and the black preacher and then the the uh, uh, the black um churchgoer as well. And 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 until until the 1970s, really, the 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 one of the divides between the two white and black evangelicals is that white evangelicals were not politically engaged. 
um, they were largely apolitical. And, you know, I, I say this in part because I come out of that, that world and that tradition, and I was very much aware of what was going on in the middle decades of the, 19th, of the 20th century. Whereas within the black tra tradition, there was never any question <laughs> that uh, the, the black preacher had to be involved in politics. He, he had to look out for the needs of his, his congregation. Uh, or her congregation, usually his, of course, uh, and so that was that was that was one of the differences up until that time. And uh, as whites became politically activated uh, or uh, politically active in the 1970s, um, and especially throwing their support to Ronald Reagan in 1980, then they began to veer rather uh, rather um, hard to the right. Uh, so that the religious right, I think, has become the most reliable constituency of the Republican Party, much the way that uh, labor unions were mo the most reliable constituency of the Democratic Party. Um, and so that's that's part of the reason for the division, I think. Do you see any trends that might be chipping away at that uh, base of tribalism that is that racist core? What, what might be changing them even now? I, well, I think uh, my my best hope is in uh, generational change. <laughs> uh, a younger generation of evangelicals is pretty fed up. Uh, in in particular, what motivates them? And and by the way, I'm I'm doing this really uh, anecdotally. I don't have I don't have uh, surveys to back me up on this. But you know, there's enough anecdotal evidence to suggest that what really motivates them and their ideas is uh, climate change and the environment. Um, the younger generation of evangelicals uh, understands that uh, you, you know, we, can't, <laughs> we can't ignore ignore the world around us, particularly because they have to live in it longer than, than we do. Uh, they have to they have to to do something about that. That combined with the uh, uh, the embrace of of uh, Donald Trump, I think, uh, has been disillusioning for a younger generation of evangelicals. There's even a term that some of them are using called exvangelical, uh, which is a little too cute for my taste. But that's that's how many of them are describing themselves in order to try to uh, make a distinction between themselves and their core beliefs. And what they see is uh, is how the religious right is is uh, is acting out on those beliefs. And uh, you know, uh, I have to say the the leadership of that movement is just uh, pathetic, as far as I'm concerned. Franklin Graham and Tony Perkins and all these people. I would just uh, so there, there are no words. So there are some <laughs> rays of hope on the horizon. Thank you. Well. I, if we can survive until then. From our words to God's ears, if you don't mind my saying that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Norsworthy? Oh, I'm sorry, Jim, did you have something else? Okay. Bill? I, actually, I, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on your own religious uh, perspective. Uh, oh, I think sure. you indicated you're a, an Episcopal priest. I am, yeah. I am, yeah. yeah. And uh, right. just for full disclosure, I am, I grew up Episcopalian. Oh, okay. And right. uh, so. Uh, we, we'd love I, to I, have you back. Yeah. Well, let me just. Let <laughs> I'm me not just back yet. For, let me just jump in here for a moment and tell you that I was in the process of converting to become an Episcopalian when I discovered I was an atheist. I had an atheist I see. Yeah. in the classroom yeah. of conversion. <laughs> I used to be. I so uh, about in my high school uh, years uh, was when I started to really question what I was doing uh, with Episcopalianism. And uh, actually, I didn't have any real objection to Episcopalians and uh, still don't really. But the whole idea of what they were talking about just wasn't making any sense to me anymore. And yeah. that's when I kind of started gradual, gradually evolving away from it. But I would yeah. be interested to know your own journey about that. Sure. I mean, I, I'll, I'll try not to get into the weeds on this, but uh, yeah, I grew up uh, uh, evangelical. My father was a minister in the Evangelical Free Church for 40 years, and uh, I honor him. I have both his, uh, 
his ministry and his memory. Um, he he uh, was a, a very good man, and and uh, you know I I, I I I've never really run away from that. I don't think. Um, and then I went to college in 1972 in Evangelical College, and then went to a seminary as well, where I worked um, in addition to uh, getting a degree. And uh, I was very much involved in that world, but I also began to learn about my own history as an evangelical. And uh, one of the things I talk about in the new book uh, is that Evangelicals in the 19th century, very much in contrast to the religious right, evangelicals were very much involved in reforming society and doing so in a way that if you line them up on a contemporary political spectrum, they would lean very far to the left in terms of their concern for immigrants, uh, the rights of women, uh, abolition of slavery, um, you know, which is not to say that there were not some evangelicals who defended slavery. I'm not going to uh, deny that. Uh, prison reform, uh, other movements in the 19th century that uh, would be considered leftist by today's standards. And that's where evangelicals lined up. And um, so I began to learn about that history. And then I uh, began to see how contemporary evangelicalism had really defaulted on that, on that legacy and uh, made me begin to look uh, elsewhere. I'm, I'm compressing a lot of years here <laughs> into a very short narrative. Uh, but in graduate school, I began to attend an Episcopal church at, uh, in, in Princeton. And uh, I just, I, I felt like I came home. I, I fell in love with it. Uh, I, I sometimes joke that I became an Episcopalian in reaction to the, the aesthetic deprivation of my childhood. And I think there's probably something, uh, something to that. But I just uh, come to really love the Episcopal Church. And one of the reasons I love the Episcopal Church, Judy, is uh, precisely because of what you said, that is to say it maintains this sense of mystery. And religion for me allows, uh, it, it allows for the possibility of transcendence. Uh, I sometimes describe myself as living in an enchanted world where there are forces at play that I can't begin to understand, much less explain. And I wouldn't live anywhere else. Uh, so the mystery of the Eucharist, for example, is something that I find very sustaining. And, 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 uh, and I recognize that, that a lot of people will say, well, that's a, a, you know, a sort of a crutch or whatever it might be. And I, I, you know, I, I, I acknowledge that argument and I, I honor that argument, but that's not what it is for me. And uh, I, I embrace the mystery. I embrace living in this enchanted universe. And uh, that, that's where I want to remain. Thank you. That's a short answer. It's a much that's longer, <laughs> much longer a good narrative. One. <laughs> and as they say, and as the kids say, TMA, TMI. So I don't want to get into that <laughs> too much information. Bill, did that answer your question? Indeed, yes. <laughs> I, I too was raised in. I was raised in a fundamentalist church, a church, uh -huh, Christ, yeah, and then yeah. progressed yeah. slowly up the ladder to the Episcopalian, which was the last yeah. thing that I was in. Um, could right. you tell us a little bit about your new book? Yeah, it's. Uh, well, I mean, the, uh, you know, put it out, you know, here I am, Vanna White or whatever. Um, uh, bad faith, rise, race and the rise of the religious right. Um, I became interested, well, I, the, the narrative from the religious right has always been we got into politics because of abortion and because of the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973. And again, I was living in that world uh, through the 1970s, and I, it just wasn't it just didn't sound right to me. And what happened actually, um, in many ways, the catalyst for the book was uh, November of 1990. I was at that time teaching at Columbia. I was just a, a, a new um, professor there, assistant professor there. And I was invited to Washington to participate in this conference. And I, I guess I didn't pay much attention to the invitation, but I got into into this uh, conference room, a hotel conference room. And there was a kind of who's who of the religious right, including uh, Ralph Reed, head of the Christian coalition, uh, Ed Dobson, who, was, who had been one of uh, Jerry Falwell's acolytes at Moral Majority, Richard Land from the Southern Baptist Convention, 
uh, Donald Wildman from the American Family Association, um, uh, Richard Vigory, the conservative direct mail guru, and uh, Paul Weirich, who's really the architect of the religious right. And it turns out that this, uh, this gathering was a, meant to be a 10-year celebration of the anniversary of Ronald Reagan's election to the presidency. Well, I hadn't celebrated 10 years earlier, and I was in no mood to celebrate <laughs> 10 years later. Uh, but nevertheless, here I find I found myself in this in this room, and they're talking about the history of this movement, the, the religious right. And in the first session, Paul Weirich, who again is the the, the co-founder of the Heritage Foundation, the architect of this uh, the religious right. He, he makes this impassioned statement in the course of the first session. He says, he said, let's remember that we didn't get involved politically as a movement in response to abortion or in response to Roe v. Wade. Uh, no, we got involved in politics because of a defense of uh, the tax exemption of these evangelical institutions, including Bob Jones University. Well, Ed Dobson, one of the, again, uh, Falwell's uh, um, right-hand man at normal moral majority immediately said, yeah, he said, that's right. And abortion had nothing to do with it. And so at, at, at that break, then I pulled Weirich aside. And I said, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. And she said, he said, absolutely not. He said, I've been trying since, since the Goldwater campaign to get these people interested in politics. He said, I tried the school prayer issue. I tried pornography issue. I tried the women's equality issue. I tried uh, abortion issue. Nothing got their interest in politics until the IRS started coming after their schools. And so that kind of set me on a decades long quest to, uh, to uncover the real origins of the religious right. And so, um, you know, I, I've written about it various times and, and probably um, most famously, I suppose, in, uh, uh, in Politico in 2014, I wrote um, uh, an article it called the real origins of religious right or something like that. And at one time they told me that was the most popular article they'd ever published. And I'm sure that's no longer the case, but at one time it was. Uh, but I, I, I keep getting calls about this and you know media appearances and so forth. So I just decided to, to, to write it up uh, as a book, put footnotes in it uh, to, to underscore everything that, uh, that I found. But uh, the, the, the findings really are quite remarkable. Um, I'll just say a couple of things about demolishing what I call the abortion myth. The abortion myth is the fiction that this movement got going because of opposition to abortion. Uh, in 1968, the flagship mag magazine for evangelicalism, Christianity Today, held a conference with another evangelical group called the Christian Med Medical Society to discuss the morality of abortion. And these are the heavyweight theologians of the evangelical world who gather over several days and talk about this. And they issue a statement at the end of it saying, yeah, we really can't decide uh, what, whether abortion should be um, a moral issue or not, but we think it, it should be allowed, which should be legalized. 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in St. Louis passed a resolution calling for the legalization of abortion a resolution they reaffirmed in 1974 and again in 1976. When the Roe v. Wade ruling was had, handed down, one of the most famous evangelicals of the 20th century, W.A. Criswell, First Baptist Church, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, as well as uh, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, issued a statement applauding the Roe v. Wade decision. Even James Dobson, who later, of course, became an implacable foe of abortion, issued a statement in 1973 saying that the Bible was silent on the matter of abortion and that it's perfectly reasonable for evangelicals not to worry about the fate of the, of the fetus. So you put all that together and you come up with what I call the abortion myth. Uh, Jerry Fall, which is another, another factoid, I guess, what they call it these days. Jerry Falwell did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February of 1978. That's more than five years after Roe v. Wade. So I try to demolish what I call the abortion myth. And then I say, what really happened? And what really happened was this is a movement that galvanized in defense of racial segregation. 
at places like Bob Jones University. So uh, that's the book. And, uh, and then I try to bring it all the way up to Donald Trump uh, and, and try to explain uh, the evangelical support for Donald Trump, which of course on the face of it, as you all know, is rather improbable that uh, a movement claiming to be concerned about family values would em embrace somebody like uh, Donald Trump. So that's a, that's a quick precy of the, of the book. I always thought- Thank you for asking. Oh, no problem. I'm quite interested in it. I, I kind of always, I never researched this, but I've always thought that the reason they took on the abortion thing as a cover for their racism was because they wanted to unite with the Catholic Church and well, um, build that coalition. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure that's it immediately. I think that was one of the side, side benefits for it. Um, because there still is a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment uh, in the 1970s among, yeah. among evangelicals. And you probably remember that growing up. I mean, I was told when I, grew, when I was growing up by my parents, if I ever married a Catholic, I'd be disowned. You know, that, that was that sort of intensity of anti-Catholicism, which has abated uh, and largely because of the abortion issue. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, uh, the adoption of the anti-abortion stand was a cover for the real origins uh, of the movement. And let's think about it. You know, it's a fairly low, you know, advocating for a fetus is a fairly low cost uh, enterprise. <laughs> you don't have to provide health care for the fetus. You don't have to provide education. You don't have to provide, um, you know, you know, general, even civil rights for that uh, fetus. It's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easy position to, yeah. to take. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, it, it was attractive. And they did, I mean, I go into it in the book, I'm not going to go into it here, but they did kind of stumble onto the issue in the late 1970s. But even as late as August of 1980, when Reagan addressed that huge crowd of evangelicals at Re Reunion Arena in Dallas, I read through his speech, which is out at the, the uh, Reagan Library in, in uh, Simi Valley, California. In that speech, he talks about creationism. He also attacks Jimmy Carter's IRS for going after the tax exemption of evangelical schools. He did not mention abortion even once before a crowd of some people estimate as many as 20,000 cheering evangelicals in August of 1980. So even that late, abortion was still not an issue that uh, that was claimed by evangelicals. Although I, I can remember in the 70s seeing Ralph Reed, I was at a student at FSU and he came and talked to us about uh, his anti-abortion stance. Ralph Reed did? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well. Yeah, I, yeah, I was working I, at the center at the time, so I was very aware of it. Yeah, um, yeah. Joe Reinhardt, you have a question or comment? Uh, please unmute yourself. I do and I did. Thank um, you. That's fascinating uh, about the uh, true um, uh, history and path to prominence of, of the abortion issue uh, in particular. But um, as atheists, uh, often, and myself, uh, often uh, are really puzzled, uh, if not amazed, by the ability of believers to compartmentalize uh, their beliefs. So I had a couple of questions you, you earlier said about your transformation from an evangelical to an Episcopalian. Why would you why would you stop at being an Episcopalian? Uh, there's a line in the movie Samson um, where he gives up Christianity and he doesn't want to trade it to worship Baal. He says, why, why trade one idiocy for another? Uh, my question is um, about faith. Do you really think that, that Lazarus had been dead for three days when, when Jesus brought him back to life? Or, or that that he went up on a mountain and saw all the riches of the world. Um, I'm I'm I I don't know that one way or another, but I'm prepared to believe that yes, it might have happened. Yeah, sure. I I, I I'm I'm prepared to live in a world where where miracles happen. That uh, I I refuse to I refuse to allow the canons of enlightenment rationalism be the final arbiter of truth. No, that doesn't apply to your, your financial dealings uh, uh, at the bank. 
I mean, uh, if I were to come up to you on the street and say, well, why don't you give me all your money? Anything could happen and, and you may benefit from it. Uh, I couldn't well, persuade you to do that. That, that, I mean, that would be that's what I'm saying. You, that, you can compartmentalize the fantasies, but when it comes to reality, you're right on the money. Um, I mean, if you came up to me with with uh, with that proposition, I'd have to uh, I'd have to uh, I'd have to show you my gun. <laughs> yeah, probably. I'd I'd have to I have to consider uh, the odds, uh, and uh, I probably would say no. <laughs> probably but you no. you think that the odds that somebody came back from the dead uh, and had been dead so long that he stinketh? You think the odds on that are pretty good? Well, yeah, I mean, and, you know, I'm sorry. Not, no, 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 that's fine. That's not, no, I don't mind a bit. I don't mind a bit. If you want me to stop, I will. I, I, I don't, I don't mind a bit. No, I, you know, I, and that's, that's not a cornerstone of my faith, uh, you know, that particular uh, story. And I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge, I certainly do acknowledge that uh, the gospel. I could drum up 50 are, more in no, no time uh, at a, all. I collection, well, no. the, the, I'm sorry. The the gospels are a collection of stories and people's uh, recollections. Many times, decades after things happened or they didn't happen, uh, that uh, that has been given down to us. And uh, but I'm prepared to say at the same time that those stories are valuable and uh, the, the the gospels are a collection of people's encounters with Jesus I, I'll and how them. those. All those encounters change their lives, and that to me is is instructive. Um, so, do I do I stake my faith or my intellectual reputation on uh, the resurrection of Lazarus? No, I no, I don't. That's not to me. That's not a. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to die on that mountain. Uh, the resurrection of anyone else? Do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Yes, absolutely, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. I take that as an article of faith, yes. Is that it, Joe? Uh, no, but I, yes, it is. I just want you to consider that faith is not a virtue. You should you should disabuse yourself of that notion. That's all. Okay. I'm not sure I agree, so we'll have to disagree. No, I didn't expect you to, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for entertaining me. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> I, um, I, I would like to say that one of the things that turned me to an atheist was science and reading all kinds yeah, of things, sure. including history. I was a history major. And the awe that I feel when I look at Hubble is not based on some supernaturalism, but just on nature and, and what it is out there. It's just amazing to me uh, what exists. Um, and if I were to believe in a God, it would not be the Christian God. It could not mm -hmm. possibly be what's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, there's too much hate and um, anger and violence and all of that in the Bible. But I don't, I didn't really ask you here to talk about your religion or yeah. to try no, to. That's fine. I, no, I don't mind. I don't mind doing so. Yeah. I'm, and I, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't think that uh, you know what you just said uh, applies to Jesus frankly I, I think Jesus was uh, um, I, I don't see Jesus as a preacher of hate uh oh here comes Joe <laughs> he's the one he said he's the one who said he came with the sword mm -hmm. yeah well I think we have to put that in context but yes we, yes I acknowledge that Jim Peterson you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Would the, would the weight of the Christian worldview and philosophy be the same for you, whether Jesus actually existed or not, whether he is uh, truly a man or or a myth? Uh, if he is a myth, then there is um, there are certain postulates that are out in the world attributed to him may not ever have been said by him but does it matter does it matter to you what, what difference is there? yeah it matters to me i mean you want to turn me into a jeffersonian and i'm not ready to go there i'm i'm i want to i want to maintain uh, my faith 
Uh, yes, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I don't think there's any doubt in the historical record that uh, a person named Jesus existed, that he was crucified. Uh, there's certainly con certainly contestation over whether or not he raised he, he was raised from the dead three days later. I certainly understand that, uh, but certainly there was a person of that uh, uh, nature who lived, and uh, whose teachings have been recorded, perhaps imperfectly. I mean, we don't know that um, uh, in in the gospel, in the gospels, and um, yes, that's important. Jefferson acknowledged that. Uh, you know, many others, certainly that's the kind of the cornerstone of the Unitarian uh, faith uh, is that Jesus is a good moral teacher, but he was not divine in any stretch, any way, way shape or form. Um, and that's, you know, I, I honor people who believe that, who hold to that, uh, but that's not, that's not my faith. No, my, my faith is, uh, goes beyond that. Well, I wanted to say that this is a very delicate, a very delicate uh, turn that we've taken here. And I, I wanted to say that we uh, have learned a great deal from uh, what you have done, what you have written, and what you've told us in this session. And uh, we, uh, I, I think that, uh, not speaking for everybody, but certainly for, uh, I think, the majority of us, we really appreciate your being here and what we have learned from your presence. And uh, You're we're, we're not trying to goad you or to uh, un un uh, undermine uh, what you believe, but no. you know, we can't, we can't help yes. to, be, uh, to be very cognizant of the effect of faith on people. And so this is a constant subject that we, that we get into, and we, we, still, we still, dare I say, love you and appreciate you, but at the same time, we want to challenge you to a certain degree. Yeah, that's fine. I don't I've mind learned a, bit. a lot. So. I, I want to say, Tim, if I may, it was never my intention to challenge your faith. What, what fascinates me was your ability to compartmentalize it. Well, I mean, I would, I would contest that, that was, caricature. Well, that was but, really what I was looking in to delve into. No, I understand. How do no, you do that? You know, I understand. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I, I again, I would contest that character, character, uh, characterization, but. Um, uh, I understand well, that. I, well, I have no you want to. How do you do it? Well, I think I've explained that. I mean, I, this is, uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, I'll say it again. I, I, I refuse to allow the canons of enlightenment and rationalism be the final arbiter of truth. I think truth is a larger construct, a larger entity. And truth is not always exclusively accessible to rationality. <laughs> I have to tell this then, of course, that's why uh, truth is stranger than fiction is because fiction has to make sense. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I, we do have one question in the, sort of a question in the chat and um, I, I would ask you the, someone wants to know what wisdom did Jesus impart? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I'd start with the Beatitudes, Matthew 5 to 7. Uh, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, uh, turn the other cheek. Um, I love your enemy. Take care of those who are on the margins, those Jesus called the least of these. Uh, he even said that was the criterion for entering the kingdom of heaven, was whether or not you could attest that you had done those things to those Jesus called the least of these. Um, well, that sounds wise to me. Um, and if I can begin in my life, my pathetic little life in this earth to to uh, approach those sorts of standards, those sorts of values, I, I will I'd be a very happy man. So I'm not going to go there. I do not want, I, I did not bring you here to discuss your religious views or art. I, I don't want to bet. I'm happy to talk about <laughs> uh, as, as an Episcopalian uh, priest, that, that's your job anyway. Well, it's, that's not, I mean, it's my job um, is it's not always support myself, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's what I've chosen to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Actually, we had a we had a conversation we uh, we had a conversation about this after church this morning uh, about uh, about mystery and the importance of, of mystery and the importance of faith, the centrality of faith in the life of the believer. And I made the point that doubt is not, in my judgment, the antithesis of faith. Doubt, in fact, is an essential component of faith, because if we've got it all figured out rationally, we don't need faith. Well, we're getting up on closing time, so I just really want to appreciate your coming and talking with us and putting up with us, even though I promised you we wouldn't try to deconvert you. We can't help ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you didn't succeed either. So. <laughs> I didn't think we would. <laughs> but uh, we really appreciate it. And I'm going to be looking forward to reading your new book. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for helping us understand uh, the basis for uh, the history of and the basis for uh, church state separation a little better. Because uh, even though. Uh, we, we want to protect religious freedom for everyone, whether they're atheists, agnostics, Jewish, Muslims, whomever. Right. We just don't want yep. their faith imposed on everybody else. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, 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 I heartily concur. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, next week, we will be having uh, someone from the American Atheist Association, um, the lawyer Jeffrey Blackwell talking about legal cases uh, concerning church-state separation. So uh, does anyone have anything they want to say before we go? Uh, any questions, any more questions, or any, okay. any comments? Great presentation. Loved it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I Thank wish you. you all well. I would say I would say God bless, but that wouldn't, you know. <laughs> Amen. Amen. for you to say it. We, we don't mind. That's your choice. <laughs> Good night to all. Yes, and a good night to all. Thank you. If you are pleased with our programs, please tap the like button and then subscribe to our channel. Don't forget the bell so you don't miss any notices of new material. We usually post new content every week. See our created playlists to discover events thus far this year or to see a list of topics and speakers from our rapidly growing and diverse collection since 1992.